Hi everybody, welcome back. So, by overwhelming <laughs> comments, uh, I decided to go ahead and do a video on the protect circuit modification to the Kenwood KR710. And in addition to that, I thought I would take the time to explain protection circuits in general. And I also wanted to talk about some other circuits that are kind of related to protection circuits. Now, I went and did all that, and then we went ahead and built the little circuit board. And what we're going to work with today is going to be this little kit that you can purchase on eBay. And I think they sell them on Amazon and, and AliExpress as well. They've been online available from China or wherever they make them for a good, I don't know, four or five years now at least. And they've been sold as cheap as $5 for the whole kit. I mean, you can't even buy these little relays. Even though they're generic relays, you can buy an Omron, uh, what is it, a G5 series and it'll drop drop in replacement for these so you can buy a high quality relay to upgrade this kit if you want to but that's where all the fun began <laughs> so i did the, i filmed all of the video for the theory of how protection circuits work and the different types of them because there's more than one type of protect circuit that, that they implement in these amplifiers and then i went ahead and did the build on this and was ready to start testing it really and we didn't have a schematic they don't have a schematic available so you can't find it online uh, for some reason this just is one circuit that's been around for years maybe some people have reversed engineer maybe some people haven't but as it turns out I ended up doing that I ended up sitting down and reverse engineering the board and it's actually a for the price, a really good circuit, but it does have uh, one problem that we're going to have to address. There's actually a couple problems that you need to address if you're going to purchase one of these and use them. Now, there are other ones for a little more money, and these can be $15 or $20 that use a much larger relay, and they use an integrated circuit and I think it's a UPC, what is it, 1237 or something, I'm not sure. But these are really high quality. They cost more, they're a little more complicated, and uh, they have more features though. But we're not going to do that for this one because this is kind of overkill for this little tiny 28 watt receiver. And I wanted to do something that was simple to build, inexpensive to buy, very plentiful that you could buy yourself, and then kind of show you how these things work. So that's where we are right now. And we're at the point where I've drawn out a schematic. It's very messy sketch, but you, you'll get the point of what's going on. And uh, then we will go back to, I have the some footage of putting the board together and footage of installing it in the receiver. Uh, and we'll kind of try to piece all that together and I've done this over a series of a couple of weeks so once I get it all done and then we'll get that posted up now because there's so much uh, footage that I filmed of all this or that I recorded I have so much material I'm going to upload this into parts and they're both still going to be you know longer videos but I kind of want to split them so that you have one video you can go to for the theory part of it and one video that you can go to for the actual build and installation of this and, and how this specific circuit works. So this video that I'm filming right now is we're going to go in and, and finish the assembly and the installation and I'm going to go over this little schematic that I drew uh, of this board and we'll get into some of the caveats that I found in it. So if that sounds good to you, stay tuned. And again, I'm going to do both of these videos. I'm going to edit them. I'm going to probably upload both of them 
within a very short period of time of one another, so you'll be able to watch them both. Okay, we're going to do a quick overview of how this specific little board works. But if you really are more interested in the theory part of this, you're going to want to go to the other video that I'm going to post shortly after this one. And it goes into great detail on how these circuits work in general, because I'm probably going to make a couple of references here to that video. So it'll make more sense if you watch it as well, but you don't have to if you just want to build one of these and install it in your amplifier. So the first thing is, <laughs> I, I wrote the word naughty on here on these couple things because they kind of uh, well, kind of didn't follow the rules real well. In When we talked about how this DC protect circuit works, and again this is all reference back to the other video, uh, you have this resistor going into a capacitor for each channel. And this serves as serves two purposes. Number one, it acts as a low pass filter. So any really high frequency component is just going to kind of pass to gr through to ground on this and it's really going to attenuate that signal so you really don't get much over to here. And then secondary, it's also going to act like an RC time constant. So if you do have extraordinarily low frequency component in here like real hard clipping or you actually have a short in one of your transistors, so you're putting actual DC onto the speaker terminals. This this time constant here, this fifteen K and this hundred microfarad capacitor is gonna put a little delay and then as as it charges up to the threshold voltage of this circuit here, these four transistors, then it's gonna trip this circuit, which is gonna drop the relay. And uh, that's essentially how this is going to work. Now the problem that we have is on a capacitor output amplifier, so that Scott amplifier we did a while back, it actually has the midpoint set at a positive voltage and then you have that speaker capacitor that, that kind of decouples that DC component from the speakers itself. And I've showed in my amplifier classes video how even though you, you can have a theoretical AC signal there, it's always positive <laughs> with reference to ground. So I kind of showed the signal path on that. So for something like that, this circuit would work, even though you really don't need a circuit like this because of the capacitor that blocks the DC, right? But here's the problem. In an amplifier like this Kenwood that we're working on, you have a complementary output. So you have a PNP transistor and an NPN transistor, and you have a negative voltage and a positive voltage and those two voltages, depending on which side turns on, on the positive half cycle or the negative half cycle, you could either have a positive going voltage or a negative going voltage at the speaker terminals. Okay, The speaker doesn't care about that. Speakers are designed to run on AC. But if you look down here, they are using a polarized electrolytic capacitor. So as long as the positive half cycle is what has the DC component on it, this will be just happy to charge up. But if you have the negative rail that shorts out, let's say the, the PNP transistor shorts out with the negative rail, and it puts negative voltage on the speaker terminal, you're going to put negative voltage on this capacitor. And you know what happens when you put negative voltages on capacitors, they're not very happy. So that's going to be an issue right there. But it will still work, believe it or not, because of the way these transistors are configured, but you're still putting negative voltage on this cap. The other thing you'll notice with this circuit is because you have negative voltage, this capacitor will not charge up, so you won't get that time constant. So what will happen is this circuit will react more quickly with negative voltage than it would with a positive DC offset. So if you have a negative DC offset, this thing will trip right away. 
you have a positive DC offset, it'll wait for the time constant, which depends on how, how high the voltage is as to how fast this thing will trip and hit its trip point. And you'll have the, the little delay that you have. You want that little delay in there because if you have a very low frequency AC signal, you don't want it to false trigger the signal. You only want like really hard clipping or something like that that's going to draw high current to trip the circuit. And that's the whole purpose for this little delay capacitor in here. And this also will filter out any high frequency component to attenuate it so that it doesn't false trigger the circuit either. So really, we need to do something about this. And the best thing to do would be to put a 100 microfarad non-polarized electrolytic in here. But those are kind of hard to find. You know, you can buy them, but you have to order them. So the other thing you could do is you could put two 220 microfarad capacitors back to back. So connect the negatives together, and then you'd have, you know, two caps in, in so it would look something like this. As I poke through the paper, plus, minus, minus, plus. And you'd have something like that. And this would be 220, and this would be 220 microfarads. So you'd have about 110 microfarad because uh, of these capacitors, how they how they are. But what will happen is the the this will become like a non-polarized. We call it a poor man's <laughs> non-polarized capacitor. So that's what really should be in here. That would correct that problem. Now the other unique thing about the way this specific circuit was built, it took me a little bit of head scratching and you can see all of the kind of erase marks that I did uh, correcting myself as I went through this. But you'll go back to that video that, I, that I'm going to post on the theory and you'll see that in, in its simplest form, these would go, the right and left channel would tie together and go across one capacitor. And that's going to feed into a bridge rectifier. And that bridge rectifier is configured in such a way to only allow voltage in one direction, you know, DC voltage in one polarity uh, into this trip circuit over here. And they kind of did it a little differently here in that they used four transistors and uh, instead of a bridge rectifier kind of a different thing, but if you see how they tie the bases together on here, and it's like a common base configuration, this one's common emitter. So if the if you have the voltage going uh, in a positive direction, it's going to turn this transistor on. And of course, if this turns on, it's going to pull this circuit, this signal down right here, and it's going to drop this signal, which is going to drop out the relays. Conversely, if you have a negative going voltage here, it, it's not going to go through here because it's backwards. And of course, you're putting reverse bias on this base to emitter. We won't talk about that, will we? And then what's going to happen, though, that negative voltage, because this transistor is connected backwards or, you know, connected in this direction, it's going to conduct. As it conducts, then this one is going to drag down this signal and drop out the relay. So regardless of if you have a positive or negative, it's still going to drop out the relay. One other thing I should mention. The, this, this board has a, a built-in power supply. And all you need to do is feed it with either AC or DC voltage of about 14 volts just so this 7812 regulator can, can work properly. Now here's the problem. You cannot put this, if you already have a rectifier in here, you cannot put a second rectifier in parallel with it. You'll get shorts. It'll cause problems, trust me. So that's why if you read the instructions and they're in Chinese, but you can translate it, it'll tell you must have its own uh, AC supply or something like that. If you have a some of the other amps that will have like a separate winding on the transformer for for like your lights and things, you can tap off of that and you know if the voltage is high enough. 
But if not, you're going to have to do something about that. You're either going to have to put something like this, one of these little tiny, uh, you know, s r s low low kilo kilovolt or kva or low va transformers, like this one here is only I think 10 va, and it's rated, you know, eight. You can have an output of 18 volts. So you'd either either have to wire something like this into your amplifier. Or use one of those little buck modules, and I have one I can show you. That's probably what I'm going to end up doing. And if the voltage isn't too high, you can pick off of your power supply rail here, like your positive rail, and run it through that buck regulator and reduce the voltage down to about 14, 15 volts and feed that into here. Uh, but the, the thing is, don't try putting this directly across you know here because you will cause a lot of problems especially like if you try to put it from here to here or from here to here you can see how they have like a little split supply here they're doing with a regulator and all that if you try to go across here you're going to short something out here so you're going to have to remember that when you wire and that's that's something that a lot of these like add-on boards that is a problem that they have is they have to have their own little power supply now, if there is a 12 volt supply that that is functional and that can handle the extra current of adding this board on, well, you could probably bypass this regulator altogether and just connect that directly in to here. Just tap your wire right into the one lead, you know, where you would put this, you know, in the output, just right there, just run your 12 volt power right into there and just eliminate those two components. So just a little word of warning how that works. Other than that, I'm going to go now, I'm going to put the clips in where we actually assembled this board and I'm going to come back later though once that part's all done and I'm going to show you that I'm going to swap this out uh, for a these two 220 microfarads. I'm going to try to hack them onto the board somewhere, somehow, some way. Alright, let's get to work. Whenever I build these, I always kind of usually will start with the lowest components to the highest. It's just a little easier to do. So things like resistors and diodes and those kinds of things, I'll put those in first. So let's start with those. And the board is self-explanatory. It shows you where everything, you know, what component goes where. All right. Get our resistors here. So let's start with... There's three 15Ks, which is going to be this, because they're all tied together. And then there's a 6.8K and a 100K. So we'll put that in. You know, I got to complain about, you know, how I talk too much. And, uh, you know, you get people saying that you, you know, we already know this. You don't need to repeat it. Well, I think some of you forget a couple of really important points that I think I should make here. First and foremost, this is my playtime. This is what I like to do. Okay, so it's not a hundred. I'm not teaching a college class that I'm charging you for. This is not Patreon, and any of my patrons they do so because they want to support the channel a little bit, and they want to have access to to be able to to talk to me. But I don't charge you for this, and uh, you know. I, I appreciate constructive criticism that helps us all learn, you know, if I say something wrong or whatever, but, you know, the, the personal attacks on stuff like that, really you should stop and think about what you're doing when you say things like that to people. It, you know, I kind of get it, so it doesn't really bother me, but I think it frustrates you, and, I, and you know, my question is, this is, this video you know, this channel is my playtime. This is what I do with my spare time because I like to do it. I don't do it for any profit. I don't really care about profit. I don't care about how many viewers. <laughs> I don't care if somebody subscribes or unsubscribes. That's why I never do the give me the like and subscribe crap. So I don't really give a crap about that. Uh, if something bothers you that much or if you don't like something, my question to you is why do you watch it? I mean, you know, 
realistically. And I'm saying this because I've had a couple of comments. You know, I have people that, that take time out of their day to try to do something mean just because, you know. And I, I can't fill in the blank because why, though. Um, you know, I don't force people to come onto this channel and watch it. I don't expect anything out of those people in exchange. So it seems like they just want to be mean. Or, in some cases, I don't think everybody's a troll or mean, but I do think some people kind of get a little bit too uptight about things that aren't important in life. Like how long somebody's video is, or if they say something a certain way or pronounce a word the wrong way. And I, I have to say this to you guys, to be fair, uh, because I think you're just going to frustrate yourself if all you want to do is, you know... <laughs> complain about the length of my video or what I say or how my accent is or you know my hand shakes or whatever the hell it is you know this is again as I said my playtime I do it because I want to and I ask nothing in return from you and I'm very happy if you enjoy it and if you don't I'm more happy if you don't watch it because the last thing I want to do is annoy somebody. But I really can't, other than tell you not to watch it, I can't help it if you don't like it, if you're still watching it. So, uh, just think about that for a while. Okay? Now, enough about that. So, let's put this together. And you can see, I'm not getting too crazy bending the leads and all that. There we go. Get a little better on the camera here. I don't know how much of it I cut out. And again, you can solder these before you clip them. Or you, I clip them before I solder them in most cases, but not always. It just seems to make it a little better solder joint. It allows the end of the lead to absorb solder so you don't have the bare copper. And that does help it from corroding, especially transistor leads. That's a big deal. Because um, when you cut it, the end is no longer tinned. The other thing is there are little bending jigs if you want to make these really neat and get really nice crisp angles on the, on the resistors when you bend them. I have many of them but I just too much work for me to use and really doesn't affect how the circuit works I think if I was building this for you know something really formal I would go through all that but for little projects like this for fun I don't really bother but it's up to you again when you go to the bench it's your play time you do it with what you like and what gives you the most satisfaction But I don't criticize other people for stuff like that, for their videos and things. I appreciate that people take the effort to put things on videos. And I'll be honest, I don't, in all honesty, I can't recall a time that I ever hit a dislike button. Not that I'm against that, because I do think the dislike button does help people to understand about their videos, you know, what's, what's more popular and less popular, especially people that do this for a living and stuff, and that do it for profit. So I'm not against that, but it's just my personality. I can't see... My dislike is I just don't watch the video, you know, and maybe I don't hit the like button. And even if, even sometimes videos I like, I don't hit the like button because I don't think about it. You know, I don't have the time. I just kind of move on, but I really like the video, and sometimes I will comment, especially when I know somebody went really above and beyond, uh, just for the sake of doing it. I want to show my appreciation. But, uh, yeah, that's just kind of how I think about that sort of stuff. YouTube is kind of a weird thing. It's taken some getting used to for me, because I don't do these kinds of things. Everything I do is live. 
anytime I've taught a class or done something, it's always been in a group, you know, in front of a crowd of people, and uh, you know, not staring at a camera. And if somebody has a question or a comment or somebody's not happy with something, they're right there and they can voice that opinion right there and then. And uh, you know, this kind of stuff is a little bit different. So a little bit of a learning curve for me. You know, when I grew up, there was no internet, there was no cell phones, there was, you know, none of this. You know, if you learned electronics, you either made friends with somebody who was willing to teach you, or you read a lot of books and did a lot of experimenting in your basement. That's kind of how I came up in it. I didn't have the advantage of what a lot of the young people today have, man. I really envy you guys because there's so much good stuff out there, you know, especially with YouTube. You can watch these little videos, not necessarily mine, but, you know, some of the other ones out there. There's guys who do this, like, for a living. And, uh, you know, it's worth patronizing them because it's how they earn their living and they put a lot of time into this. And it's for your benefit. You know, you learn things that you had to go to college and, and then work out in the field for a long time to be able to learn, you know. And yeah, I'm not bending these leads squared off. I'm just kind of pushing them in there. That's not really the best way to do it. But again, I'll let you know the proper way. And if you want to do it that way, it's up to you. I think that would not a problem. That'd be cool. I'm just being a little lazy here. And again, we'll look at these transistors maybe and get a little better feel for what this is. Again, this is a little different circuit than the ones we looked at, but the concept is the same. I looked online and I was surprised I could not find a schematic for these ones. Usually when you buy these like on eBay or something, the seller will quite often in in the pictures you know the images they put with the with the uh with the ad for it they'll actually try to uh put a picture of a schematic there and you can actually blow it up on the screen and kind of screen capture it or sometimes they'll even put a link you can download it but for some reason they did not do that with these ones and one other thing i didn't talk about that larger kit this one right here, it's very interesting. It has all of the features we talked about, uh, including the AC Sense, and the Overload Protect, which is only part of the Overload Protect circuit is in there. And the way it does it is through a Speaker Protect integrated circuit. And yes, there is such a thing. And uh, if I remember, I'll show one of them to you. Pioneer was really big on using that integrated circuit in some of their ge later gear and uh, it really eliminated the need for a lot of the external components. You just basically had that chip, a couple resistors and capacitors and you had a full-blown protect circuit. And uh, they quit making, it, they were, the chip was made by NEC out of Japan I believe. And they quit making those a long time ago. Even the even the NTE versions are not available anymore. But you can get a Chinese copy of it, and they actually seem to work. I have them, and uh, I've used them, and they they work perfectly. They work just like the originals. The data sheet with them is not as complete as the original NEC data sheet. So if you do want to work with those chips, you might want to download the NEC data sheets from the original Japanese version. It's the same, everything, the data is the same. It's just it has a little more information about how, how the chip works. And they don't have that on the aftermarket data sheet. So just a little tip there for that. Yeah, there we go. I don't even think I'm going to clean the flux on this board. I'm just going to go ahead and put it together and try it out. I'm sure it's going to work, I mean, unless we have a bad transistor. That's another thing. Um, if you want, you can test the components in your little component tester like this. 
before you put them in because I'll tell you these double-sided boards they have uh, solder pads on the front and on the back and when you solder them in it's really hard to get it back out so just keep that in mind it's you know if you especially if you don't have a desoldering station or really good solder braid or something like that you're gonna have a hard time getting the components back out so you might want to test these components before you put them in and I say that as I'm soldering them in <laughs> without testing them but uh, you get the point most of these little kits no matter what it is whether it's a speaker protector anything you get from these real low-cost Chinese kits uh, you want it, it it does benefit you to test the components before you install them just for that very reason okay so the plus and minus is marked here and on the LED the positive is going to be the long lead and it's also going to be the smaller lead opposite the anvil so you see inside there you have that little element that looks like an anvil see it I don't know if you could see that in there it's hard to see but the anvil is always connected to the negative and the small smaller part of it is connected to the positive and then the longer lead is usually the positive and uh, not always but usually we'll just say all right I'm doing this with my glasses off because my up-close vision sucks with doing work like this so I use those multifocal lenses and I hate them I'm really really looking forward to getting the surgery one of these days but my eyes are really healthy other than you know the you know the poor vision eating glasses and so the insurance won't pay for that unless you have cataracts or glaucoma or something you know and I don't have any kind of eye condition for the insurance to pay for it so I'd have to pay out of my pocket and with two kids in college and you know all these other things in a full-time business that I take care of and all that not exactly uh, <laughs> on my priority list right now I just take the glasses off and squint and, uh, and I've had so many pairs of glasses some work better than others but you know there's you can only adjust them so much you know where your intermediate and up close vision and everything is all right I'll put these capacitors in first and it looks like they're all the same value if I go this one here is 100 microfarads 100 100 and 100 yeah we're good and these are 105 C capacitors and they are made by Suncon I don't know I've heard Sun on but not Suncon so I don't know if these are they're probably garbage but hey they might be really good caps I've seen some of these Chinese ones that held up really well I just don't I don't pass judgment on things unless I test them because you know I know people have personal feelings towards things like that and you know, I get that for sure but being realistic about things you know you can pat you can jump to conclusions and you're not always right so you're better off kind of testing it first okay I'll clip these just makes it a little easier to get to hard to work the solder and iron around these leads uh, just me personally but I'd rather clip them as long as you can get them to stay in some people don't like to bend the leads over which you know that's another whole debate you know my saying three things you don't talk about in public is politics religion and capacitors because they're sure to get you into an argument
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Hope you can see all this. I don't. I haven't been looking up at the viewfinder of the camera to make sure I'm staying in frame. I hope I am. I apologize if I'm not. All right. Getting close. Let's put this guy in. Our linear regulator. We did videos on linear regulators. Really cool devices. And the nice thing about them versus a, you know, a buck, a buck converter or a boost converter or, you know, switch mode converter is no high frequency stuff. It's all DC. So, not not very efficient, that's for sure. But I think I'll touch this up again. See that copper? On the end, I don't know if you can see it, but you see how it's no longer tinned? That's kind of why I like to cut them and then solder them. And then that'll get the solder into the end of the lead. Because what happens is the corrosion will get into the copper. And then it'll kind of travel up the lead and go into the device itself. And that's why you get shot noise and things in transistors sometimes. That's not always the reason that it happens, but that contributes to it. And you can reduce that just by soldering after you crop the leads, if that makes sense to you. Now, another thing we'll get into here in a minute is these little blue terminals here. We'll talk about those here in a little bit. And this is your speaker relays, and they're not very large, but they're rated at 12 amps at 120 volts AC and 10 amps at 28 volts DC. So they're pretty robust if you go by that. Uh, looks pretty small to me for that high of current rating, but hey, who am I to judge? Again, I've used these many times. I'll buy like, you know, four or five of these at once because you can buy bulk of them and get them a lot cheaper. And then I'll keep them around for these kinds of amplifiers and we'll pop them in there. And I've never had one cause me any troubles. They, they work really well for what they are and they're very inexpensive. I mean, the relays by themselves, if you try to order them online from, you know, from Mauser or DigiKey or a reputable place like that, these relays can cost, one relay can cost more than this whole kit. Now, do I think the relay is probably better quality than these? Maybe. That's a possibility for sure. Um, but these seem to work okay. I haven't had any problems yet. Okay, looking at the rear of the amplifier here, I'm just trying to find a good place to mount this little board. And really, there's only one that really looks like a good place, and that's right back here. And that fits kind of really out of the way of everything. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything that it'll interfere with. And most importantly, there's really nothing on the back that we're going to interfere with if we put some holes. Now, you know me and drilling holes in chassis and things that don't belong there. I try never to do that in most cases. But this is not a real high, highly collectible, high-value amplifier. And we can do it in such a way that it really isn't too obtrusive. Yes, we can put four little holes for four little screws, but they'll just kind of mount back here and almost look like part of the amplifier when we're done. And we can do that in such a way that we can still access everything and we can still, and I'm going to probably try to offset it so it doesn't interfere with this little label back here because I just want to keep everything original that way, but I also want to kind of sh offset it a little bit so that I can get into these test points here and these test points here if I ever do need to uh, do an alignment on the tuner. This one's aligned very well, but always keep those things in consideration too. Remember, you're going to have to work on this amp later on, so you want to make it so that you can work on it still and you don't disrupt that. So that's what I'm going to do. We're going to mount it back here.
Now the next thing we have to do is get access to our speaker wires. Now we want to still be able to use everything as it originally is, including our speaker select board. And the speaker select is up here. This is where your switch is to select A and B speakers. So you have three bundles of wires, and I removed the tie wraps to make it a little easier to access everything. If you look these two wires here, this one and this one, these two right here, these go to the speaker terminal boards for speakers A and B. And this wire here comes off of the amplifier section, and these are your right and left channel uh, connections. So what we're going to do is we're going to desolder this ribbon cable from the board, from the speaker select board. We're going to move it over to this side here and connect it, and then we're going to add four more wires to take it back to that board. So we're essentially just putting this board in series with our speaker terminals. Okay, our speaker leads are attached here, and of course I hope I didn't get them on backwards, but oh well. <laughs> if not, if I did, we'll just have to swap them around. All right, let's put the bottom cover back on this to give it some rigidity here, and then we'll test it out. Okay, I've marked the four holes and drilled them. You can kind of see it right there. And I'm going to use these little standoffs, little brass standoffs, and uh, these little M3 screws. And they're going to look... Like I said, pretty unobtrusive. And they just go like that. And I'll just put the four in there with the little standoffs. And then the circuit board will mount, will screw right into those standoffs. And that should make it look pretty nice. Okay, here is our first modification. And you can see right next to the power transformer, I've installed this little buck regulator. And you can buy these once again on eBay, AliExpress, blah blah blah, <laughs> Amazon, whatever. These are only a couple bucks a piece. They're very, very inexpensive. And what they can do is they will allow oh, a little bit over about 35 to 36 volts in, which is good on this one because you only have about, you only have maybe about 32 volts on the rails. And it even has a 50 volt capacitor on the input, which is good. And you can adjust it to get your 12 volts. Now, the only thing is this works uh, by high frequency. So this can, can definitely put noise into the AM section of your stereo. So you don't want to mount this anywhere near the tuner section of your receiver and even at that that's not going to guarantee that it may not emit some noise that the tuner will pick up. This one it has, doesn't seem to be doing that there's no problems with it but be aware that some of these things can actually put out some nasty hash. <laughs> if they do you then you don't want to use this you'll want to use that little transformer I showed you or uh, make yourself a little linear power supply or use a linear regulator attach it to the to the power rail, something like that. On this side, what we did was, hope I'm in frame here, I removed the wires from the input, I removed the bridge rectifier, you can see there, and I removed the voltage regulator, and I just went into the voltage regulator pins with my inputs, because center pin you have in, ground, and out. So the in is, has nothing on it, the ground is connected to the ground, and the out that would have been, you know, going out to the circuit, that's our 12 volts. Now I still have these original caps in here because I want to show you what this is going to do, or what I suspect it's going to do. Let's get this put back in, and then we'll test it. Okay, we have the little buck converter adjusted for 12 volts. I have this put back together. Let's turn it on and see if it works. So that's right, it should come on, then drop out. We'll talk about a couple other mods here in a minute. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove, let's see, take two of these speaker leads out and just disconnect them from the dummy load. And I'm going to get a battery like this. And if this trips, what should happen is you should see that light come on to indicate that there is DC present on the terminal. So we're just going to use a little double A battery and you can see it pops right out. All right. And then if I have it backwards, see? And then if I turn it the other way, see how there's a delay? And that's the problem. And that's what has to do with that uh, capacitor. So we're going to now try to swap out the cap uh, for some non-polarized ones and see if that corrects that problem. Okay, we now have the non-polarized capacitors in. And if I put it one way, you'll see there's a delay. just like they're supposed to be. And if I reverse the leads, same thing. So that corrects it. So you definitely need to put non-polarized capacitors in there. Uh, or you're going to have, you're not going to get that delay. It's going to trip immediately when it's, when you have reverse voltage on there. And you could possibly damage the capacitors. So that part's fixed. Okay, we saw how it only takes just this little tiny AA 1.5 volt battery to trip the circuit. But what we don't want is when we have a low frequency, and I'm going to dial in 20 hertz, like this. What we do not want is we don't want it to trip the circuit. Okay, here we go. So you can see we're into pretty hard clipping. And there, it just tripped. So you have to be at 20 hertz and you have to be in really hard clipping before right about here's where it's going to go. Nope. There. Boom. So that's just what you want. And that's perfect. Now, if that was tripping too soon, it means we would need to have a little bit higher capacitance than that 100 microfarad. And if it was not tripping soon enough, we could decrease that capacitor. So for instance, if we moved it down to like a 47 microfarad capacitor, that would make it trip more easily. And if you put a bigger capacitor like 150 or 220 microfarad, then it would take much, much more DC for a longer time to be able to get it to trip. So that's how that works. I'm happy with the way it is now. It seems to do exactly what it's supposed to do. So everything appears to be okay. Uh, I think that's, this is going to work just fine for us. So now we have a protect circuit and once again if the one of these transistors decides to short out again, like what happened <laughs> the previous time on this, uh, the speaker won't, won't be charbroiled, which is a good thing, right? Because the transistor is pretty cheap to replace, but your speakers, not so much. All right, that wraps this one up. I hope you enjoyed it. It was quite a journey. I did it over a, quite a bit of time and several trips for work <laughs> in between. So I hope it makes sense when I get these two videos posted. But in the meantime, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, stay well, and we'll see you again real soon. Take care.